All right, we're getting ready uh, for our Sunday school time. Uh, this is uh, Railroad Creek. They seem to be uh, fairly popular this week when I had them on during the morning chat. So here they are while we're getting coming into our Sunday school time tonight. Again, that was uh, a group by the name of Railroad Creek. Uh, they had been singing together for some time. They're not singing together now. Uh, some, some friends of ours, one of them's a, a pastor's a church there in Mississippi. Uh, his sister sang with them and then two of their friends. Uh, just, uh, it was a good group. It really enjoyed, enjoyed their singing. All right, we're going to get ready to get started here tonight with our Sunday school time. So if you're, we're going to give folks just a minute or two to, to, to join in with us. I guess I could have left the, could have left the uh, music playing, couldn't I? Amen. All right, so we've got that all together. I did get just get a message from Miss Christie uh, that said that uh, Miss Lisa did take Brother Marvin to the emergency room. Uh, so just to have him. Uh, Observe, checked out, and make sure that there's nothing more serious going on. Uh, so she said he's been running 102 fever for a couple of days, and uh, he's been sleeping a lot. So you pray for him, pray for him. Uh, I know uh, they would appreciate our prayers uh, as well. So uh, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to pray. I thought we had a great service this morning. Uh, we had 28. Uh, my count was correct. We had 28 on the parking lot this morning. 
Uh, so that was a good number. And then we had 29 uh, that were watching on uh, online uh, that I could that I could count. Now some folks, I understand there there's some that are kind of uh, what do they call that uh, where they come in and they watch and don't say nothing. Uh, but but uh, there's a word for that. Uh, well, I think I just remembered what it was. I'm not going to say what it is. Uh, but but anyway, it, so but I think we do have some folks that are that are coming in and they're watching, but they're not saying that they're here or you know we're not seeing uh, their name come up. So I've had several say that, that we've watched and, and I never saw that. But anyway, uh, so we had 57 all together this morning, which I thought was a good number for our last our last. Uh, drive-in service so we'll be picking up next Sunday morning we'll be picking up with our regular services here in the sanctuary so we're excited about that and uh, looking forward to having everybody together all right uh, uh, Scott Kennedy he's peeping in yeah I, I'm, I'm gonna leave that alone Scott uh, amen yeah uh, all right brother Scott good to see you sir all right we're gonna jump in uh, tonight uh, with our Sunday school time, so we can go ahead and get as much in as possible. I, I really tell you what I'd like to do, and I, and I may do this anyway, I don't know just yet. I'd like to end our series of lessons tonight here, uh, and then next Sunday pick up with, with our next subject. I really wanted to do that on the first Sunday we were all back in the auditorium together. Um, I, I just, but with us changing the weeks, that kind of messes my plan up, my schedule. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about it. And, and here's, here's why. What, what I wanted to do the first week that we were all back, and, and I guess maybe it was kind of a, maybe not a selfish reason, but, but just I wanted to introduce what was going to be coming, what, was, what we were going to be studying. That way, those that, that may not be in our Sunday school class, if they wanted to go back and catch it later and kind of keep up with that subject once we start um, uh, our Sunday school classes back, which will still be a couple of weeks. Um, uh, you could do that. And and the subject that we're going to be starting ne next Sunday, Sunday after that, I'm not sure just yet when, uh, is going to be the, the study of church history. Um, and, and we're going to go back and, and pick it up at the time of Christ. And we're going to do our very dead level best to follow uh, the, uh, the church. And, and I'll be careful the way I use that phrase. Uh, through history uh, and, and just kind of put some pieces together, lay some things side by side uh, and let you kind of evaluate those things and look at them and make your decisions about where you stand. I'll tell you right up front what I believe, uh, where I stand, but, but uh, we're going to give you as much information as possible and let you make that determination. So we'll see about that maybe next week, maybe the week after. I don't know yet, That's just depending on what the Lord leads. Uh, but I really would like to do that while we're still collectively, all of us coming together for Sunday school to kind of whet your appetite. I, I think, I, I really believe our church needs to know where she came from. Uh, I, I really believe that our church needs to understand her history. Now, I'm not talking about the last 12, 19 years, all right? I, I'm talking about our, our, our heritage and, and how how we got where we are as a church, okay? Um, and, and kind of explain some of that. I think it would help a whole lot of us. But but anyway, okay, so we'll, I, I, I digress there. All right, we're going to get back into this, this study of, of putting the puzzle together. We've been going through, we've been studying all of the uh, different doctrinal, the, the, the doctrinal statement of our church. We'll be going through each piece. Uh, we, we've gone through these pieces here, the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures, I say Holy Spirit every time. It's written very plainly right there. Of course, I got an excuse. I can't see it. The Holy Scriptures, dispensationalism, the Godhead, uh, the person and work of Christ. We talked about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the total depravity of man. Uh, we've talked about salvation. And again, these are just some very basic but very vital doctrines that, that really our whole belief system is built on uh, and we've got to get the the foundation of all of these uh from the scriptures uh if we're going to have a true understanding of who we are uh we talked about eternal security and assurance of the believer uh, we talked about the church we've talked about separation remember we talked about separation under christ 
We talked about the second advent of Christ, the return of the Lord. We'll, we'll talk more about that when we get into the Revelation. Uh, we've talked about the eternal state of mankind. Uh, two places, heaven or hell, smoking or non-smoking. That's, that's your eternity. That's your two choices. All right? Uh, so then we talked about the personality of Satan uh, and, and learning the wiles of the devil. We talked about that. We talked about creation very quickly. We talked about the six days of creation, seven day he rested. Uh, we dealt with that very, very quickly. We talked about human sexuality for quite a while. Uh, and, and one reason we needed to do that was because of the difficulties that we face today with that subject. All right, we talked about the family relationship. Husbands and wives and, and, and parents and children and children to your parents and, and those ideas and those understandings. And, and, you know, that we do not live in the dark ages. And I understand that. And it's not, uh, you know, we just we need a proper understanding of what the Bible teaches about uh, the, the, the relationship of the sexes and all of those things. We'll go back last week. We talked about all that. All right. We're going to get into a very interesting subject, a very uh, controversial subject today. Uh, we're going to start with this idea of divorce and remarriage. What does the Bible say about divorce and remarriage? Now, I know everybody's going to come into this. This Of all of the, the subjects we've covered already, uh, everybody's going to come into this one with their own preconceived ideas. Uh, and, they're, and they're going to have them very well founded and very well laid out. And I understand that, and that's fine. But that's why I'm on this side of the camera and you're on that side. Uh, this is the doctrinal position of our church. Amen. All right. Uh, okay, so we just, just laid that out there right for that. So let's start. We believe that God disapproves of and forbids divorce and intends marriage to last until one of the spouses dies. Divorce and remarriage is regarded as adultery except on the grounds of fornication. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 through 15, the Bible says this, Yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did not he make one? Yet hath he that the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Now, when we're beginning to talk about this idea, there are a couple of things that you wanted to notice there very quickly. Well, we wanted to notice that the covenant there uh, we want to notice in verse 15 that did not he make one, one flesh, uh, two became one flesh, all right? Uh, and then we'll go on to verse 16 and verse 17. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he putteth the, that He hateth putting away. Well, that's a big statement right there. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and delighteth in, in, in them, or where is the judgment, or where is the God of judgment? So we find the connection there, and we, we just, I'm just going to read these scriptures and, and let you deal with them yourself, uh, but just an understanding of marriage and divorce, all right? Uh, I go to Matthew, take your Bible. This, this was a pretty long passage, so I didn't try to put all the words on the screen. Uh, so we got to do a little Bible study tonight. Uh-oh. This is Sunday school. Now, come on. It'll be all right. Matthew chapter 19. Verse number three. Now, I know people are already saying, but, but, I, but, now just ha hang on. Let's just go through what we have written as the scriptures here, All right? Matthew 19, verse number three, the Bible says this. The Pharisee also came unto him, tempting him uh, and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, we always want to be careful that we read the scriptures and we understand what's being asked. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Then said, they said unto him, Why does, did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? 
He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and, they, and there be eunuchs which have, been, uh, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, uh, that's a whole other subject right there. We'll talk about the eunuchs later. But uh, just the idea here, when Jesus begins to answer this question, number one, it says, can he, can he put away his wife for any cause? Well, Jesus is very quick to say, no, that is incorrect. All right? That is not God's plan. Uh, and then he, he was asked about Moses in the writing of divorcement that was given in the Old Testament. And he's very clear about the subject there uh, about what is taking place and the exception there in verse number nine. All right, sexual impurity uh, is the only exception. The only exception that is given or discussed in the scriptures. Now I'm gonna stop right here and I'm gonna say something. Just because it's given as an exception doesn't mean it should be used as an exception. Well, that's a big thought right there, okay? We'll get back to that one a little bit later. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So in Romans chapter 7, it gives us the indication that that marriage is for one man, one woman, for one lifetime. Romans chapter 7, verse 3. So that if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, again, we're, we're dealing with this idea of uh, uh, di uh, divorce and remarriage. And it's very, again, very, very clear uh, in the scriptures as we read through this. Uh, we'll go on with our statement. Although divorce and remarried persons uh, or divorced persons may hold positions of service in the church and be greatly used of God for Christian service, they may not be considered for the office of pastors and deacons. Now, again, we're, we're talking about the, uh, you know, I've heard some preachers make this comment. I, I've I could call names and I won't do that tonight, but I, I, I've heard some preachers, you know, make the comment that, boy, if you're ever divorced, you're just, you're useless. You're, you're dead to God. You can't be used for anything. Uh, well, that, that just is not biblically sound, okay? Uh, there are some restrictions that are placed on divorced uh, and remarried individuals. Uh, and, and we mentioned too here, pastors and deacons, uh, uh, you go back to the qualifications there and they're very clear about uh, about who is qualified to, to, to pastor and, and, and be ordained as a deacon. Uh, but just because someone is divorced and remarried doesn't mean that they're useless. There, there are still many divorced and remarried folks that are being used of God greatly in different areas of service. All right? And that's the whole point of that statement. I do not teach, I do not believe, I, I do not promote uh, that, that remarried or divorced individuals cannot hold any place in the church, they cannot hold any title, they can't hold any place of responsibility. That's not my position, all right? Uh, I don't believe that's the position of the Bible. Uh, I do believe that the pastor and deacon is restricted according to Scripture, uh, but there are some other things that, that, can, be, that can be done uh, by, by individuals who have experienced this, this and I'm going to use this word on purpose, this tragedy, all right? First uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. In verse number 12, a bishop thus then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Let the deacon be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. All right, uh, we'll move on. Titus chapter 1, verse 6. And if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot, riot or unruly. Again, we're talking about the qualifications of a pastor. Uh, so we find in, in this great controversy of marriage and divorce, 
in this great controversy of marriage and divorce, we find that, that I, I understand or I see, we find that man has made this a great controversy. God, God doesn't have a big problem with that. With that. He, he really understands the truth about all this. Uh, it, it's you and I that many times try to justify our thoughts and our beliefs and our wants uh, and our desires when we start getting into trouble in this area of marriage and divorce. Now, again, we're not going into a great theological discussion or debate on these things. I'm just trying to give you scripturally where our church stands on these different areas. All right, uh, then now we'll move into the idea of abortion. Uh, our church statement says this, we believe the human, that human life begins at conception and that the unborn child is a living human being. Abortion constitutes the unjustified, unexcused taking of unborn human life. All right, uh, Job chapter three, verse 16, or as an hidden untimely birth, I had not been as, as infants which never saw light. All right, as infants which never saw light. Now he's talking about his given person, uh, personality uh, uh, or, or individuality to the unborn here, all right? Uh, Psalm 51, verse five, behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Didn't, didn't bear me. You know, he's not saying I was born. He's, he's, he's connecting personality to conception. All right? Where do we believe that, that life starts? Life starts at conception. Uh, uh, Psalm 139, verse 14. I will praise these. Pardon me. My, 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 my throat's a little dry there. I, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Uh, marvelous are thy works, and that thy soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thy eyes did see my substance, yet being un unperfect, and in, thy, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there were none of them. So Psalm 139 gives us an understanding of, of God knowing that child in the womb before birth ever took place. Isaiah 44, verse 24, Then said the Lord, the Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth the roll the earth by myself. All right? Uh, as we look, uh, let's see. All right. Uh, and, and he that formed thee from the womb. All right? Uh, we, we're talking about, again, knowing from before birth. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1 and, uh, and verse 5, deal with the same thing. Listen a while unto me and hearken, ye people from, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, had he made mention of my name. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Again, we're just giving you these scriptures that show the, the, these individuals, these personalities, or these persons before birth, conception. When does life begin? All right. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou came, camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Uh, Jeremiah 20, verse 15 and verse 16, Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, A man-child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not, and let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontime. Uh, and just, uh, just, we're talking about again, we're... Uh, the, the personality of the children. Because he slew me not from the womb that my mother might have been my grave and her womb to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days shall be consumed with shame. Uh, again, before birth, this Jeremiah, the individual is recognized by God. Luke one forty four. For lo, as soon as thy voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe lit, leaped in my womb for joy. Now this is, we're talking about John the Baptist here and, and Jesus Christ before he was ever born, knew who Christ was, uh, leapt in his womb. So with that information, we come to this conclusion. Abortion is murder.
We reject any teaching that abortion uh, of pregnancies due to rape, incest, birth defects, gender selection, birth or population control, or the physical and mental well-being of the mother are acceptable. But now I'm going to say something very, very difficult right here. All right? Very, very, very hard. Okay? The very hard thing is we like to talk about trusting God in every other area. But when we, but we, but when we get bad news, if you will, sometimes we want to take matters into our own hands. Well, we'll let you think about that one. All right, we'll move right on. Talking about love, and again, we're just talking about the statements. And, and here again, we need to understand and cover. We, I know we've said some hard things over the last few weeks. Okay, We believe that we should demonstrate love for others, not only toward fellow believers, but also toward both those who are not believers and those who oppose us. We are to deal with those who oppose us graciously, gently, patiently, and humbly. And again, that, that's why we, we talked about when we talk about human sexuality, for, for instance. We were, that's why we were very careful to say this is not something that we mean to be hard-handed or, or, or uh, uh, militant about, if you, if you understand why I use that word. But we must stand where God says we need to stand. And while we still have a heart of love and a heart of understanding and a heart of a desire to help others, we also understand that we, again, must take some hard stances that some folks may not understand, but we take them out of love because we want to present the truth of the Scripture. God forbids the stirring up of strife, the taking of revenge, or the threat of the use of violence as a means of resolving personal conflict or obtaining personal justice. Uh, the old saying, he who has the biggest stick makes the rules. You know, amen. I, I don't know. I don't want to do it that way. I just want to trust the Lord and believe him. Although God commands us to abhor sinful actions, we are to love and pray for any person who engages in such sinful action. We still show a heart of love. We still reach out. We still seek to serve uh, and, and help them find truth. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 8. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. But just because we love someone doesn't mean we allow them to do anything that they want. I love my children. But as they were growing up, I did not let them just eat anything they wanted to. Why? Because they needed to grow and become healthy. Therefore, out of love, I guided them in how they should eat and how they should take care of themselves and their personal hygiene and their personal character. Because I love them, I helped to guide them. All right? Uh, we read Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Lord. We need to read that one. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Matthew chapter 5, verse 46 through verse 48. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do, do ye more than the others? Do not even the Pharisee, the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. All right. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. Uh, and as ye would that men should do uh, to you, do ye also to them likewise. Amen. We don't want... Uh, we, we don't want folks that, that disagree with us to riot and throw eggs at a church building and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Well, let's not throw eggs at them. Figuratively. 
Oh, all right. John chapter 13, verse 34 and verse 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Now, now again, this doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. But we still love each other. I mean, I know folks that like blue carpet in churches. That's the most ridiculous thing. Y'all know, know my story on that. All right. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor the, that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. All right. So we, we've got to have this, this idea of love. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Prove that things are honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Love thy neighbor. Love them. Show them love. Don't mean we agree with everything they do, but we must love them. Romans 12, 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 20 and verse 21. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And, and in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome, uh, but be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, we're just expressing that love. We're showing grace. We're giving truth. But we're doing it with a spirit of meekness and a spirit of love. Romans 13, uh, verse 8 through 10. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear full witness, thou shalt not covet. Uh, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Philippians chapter two, verse number two: Fulfill ye my joy that you be that you may that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than him, themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We've got to get to a place to where our focus is Christ above all. How can we as, we'll stop here and preach just a little bit. How can we as, as Christians, how can we prove or demonstrate to a lost and dying world that we love them if we won't demonstrate that we love the brethren who we go to church with? Now, I didn't say we was always going to like them. I mean, sometimes personalities are just, we, we rub each other the wrong way. We have different personalities. We have different likes. We, ha we have different uh, characteristics. Now, all of those things. And, and, and sometimes it's, uh, those don't match real well. And, and we kind of rub each other the wrong way. And, uh, but just because we have difficulties don't mean we don't love each other. We, we've got to get to a place where we love each other in spite of each other. And if we can demonstrate that I love the brethren, that'll help me go a long way in demonstrating that I love others as well. And that's what they need to see. They need to see a love in us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Uh, and, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, uh, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captivity by him at his will. Boy, that, that 
2 Timothy chapter 2 just kind of encapsulates all of that together. We love them, but we instruct and we guide and we teach and we seek to help them. Uh, the, the, and, and here's the words that he used here. Uh, and those that oppose themselves, that they may recover themselves. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men. I just read that, didn't we? That's the second time I've done that. All right, must have been an important verse. All right, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, but whoso hath this world's good, and sees his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's right, I plan on stopping today. <laughs> We've got about 15 minutes left. We're going to go on. Uh, we're going to look at the next subject. And we're going to do this one fairly quickly because I, I, I think we, we've got three sections or three subject headings left. Lawsuits, I think this will be fairly easy. We believe that Christians are prohibited from bringing laws, civil lawsuits against, each, uh, against other Christians or the church to resolve personal disputes. We believe the church possesses all the resources necessary to resolve personal disputes between members. We do believe, however, that a Christian may seek compensation for injuries from other Christians' insurance companies as long as the claim is pursued without malice or slander. Now that's, that's, a, that's a lawyer th phrasing right there. We're in such a mess with insurance and all of that stuff uh, that, that you had to you had to, to phrase that in a certain way. First Corinthians chapter six. Dare dare any of dare, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, ye are unworthy to judge the smallest matters? It's the idea of going before going to the law of, of Christ. Know ye not that we shall find that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. And, and the idea here is this: we're you know we're not trying to get this hierarchy of uh, of trying to set folks in power that uh, that wield this power and have no no. Let's just go to the scriptures. Let's see what the Bible says. Uh, and let's follow and let's do what thus saith the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you. No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. And the idea here, what he's dealing with, uh, is just the idea of you're doing exactly the same thing that the world does. We sh it should not be that way. We're not finished with this ver this passage. Verse 7, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. Now he's not talking about here being a doormat. He's not talking about letting everybody walk over you. But he's talking about having some compassion. And he's talking about being really, willing rather to take a, a, to receive a hurt uh, than to stand up and say, no, bless God, I, I, I deserve this and I want this. And so many times it's about I. My daddy taught me something a long time ago. And, and he, he taught me this and it served me well over a lot of years. Now, I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, what you would consider a wealthy man. <laughs> My daddy taught me a long time ago that never to loan anybody anything. He said, son, if you don't have it to give it to them, then don't do it. See, some of the biggest problems I've seen in churches is where one member borrowed money from another member for a problem they were having, and then the other member getting upset because that first member is not paying them back like they thought they should. That's foolish. That's foolishness. If that individual that gave them that money would have just given it to the Lord, then 
makes it a whole lot easier whether that individual is able to return that money or not. Because you've not given it to that individual. You've simply given it to the Lord. And you said, Lord, it's yours. I'm going to give it to you. And you take care of the rest of it. It's almost like sometimes we're going to write out a promissory note. We're going to make them sign it. You are setting yourself up for a world of hurt. In a world of, of hard feelings. and a world of hurt feelings. and a world of animosity. In a place where it should not be. I thank, my, I, I thank God my daddy had a whole lot of common sense wisdom that he was able to impart to me. And that was, that was one of them. All right. So uh, let's, let, let's make sure that we're showing love one for another. He, he said this, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Uh, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Having compassion on them, loving them. Yeah. Boy, they messed up. Have we never messed up? Boy, they sure sinned. Have we never sinned? Well, not to the not to the extent that they did. He did as guilty of one point. Amen. Okay. All right, I'll quit preaching. All right, let's, let's, let's go back to our deck there. Then the next one we talk about would be missions. Would be missions. Now we're just finishing up. We've got this one and one more. And we've, and we've got our doctrinal statement, the whole thing. This one's on missions. This is fairly simple, fairly straightforward. We believe that God has given the church a great commission to proclaim the gospel to all nations so that there might be a great multitude from every nation, tribe, ethnic group, language group who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, that's very simple. As ambassadors of Christ, we must use all available means to go to the foreign nations and not wait for them to come to us. Of course, Matthew 28 is going to be one of the biggest uh, uh, statements on that. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Amen. We understand that mission work starts at home Starts right here at Calvary Baptist Church, right here in Marshall County, in your neighborhood, my neighborhood, and goes from there. But yet it does not end until we reach the uttermost part. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 24, verse 46 through verse 48, And he said unto them, this it, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. John 20 and verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, a very familiar passage. Uh, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and in the uttermost part of the earth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. Ambassadors unto Christ. So that is a statement on missions. We believe that missions are very, very important. Matter of fact, around here, we like to say this, that we believe that missions are the lifeblood of the church. As we stay involved in what Christ desires and designs for us, with that, we'll continue to see the blessings of God. That's why we've worked very, very diligently in this time of COVID-19 to keep up with our missionaries. I, I cannot tell you the number of missionaries I have talked to that have come back and said, churches are struggling right now and they're not able to send in they're not able to give their mission support and missionaries are suffering right now because they don't have 
finances to support their families. And listen, whether they're on the foreign field or whether they're back in the States, they still, they don't have a, a, what we would call a regular job. They, they don't get a paycheck. They're not getting unemployment. I just thank the Lord that he's positioned our church in a, in a place to where we've been able not only just to, we, and when we've not had to dip into any reserves for that. God has just provided through our church every penny that, that we had com, have committed to missionaries plus a little. Which brings us to the last statement, which I don't, I'm not sure why this got put in here. Last, maybe because it's one of the most unpopular other than that divorce thing. But uh, uh, so well, here, here it is. I'll just give it to you. Yeah, it's on giving. Okay, amen. Let's just read it. We believe that every Christian, as a, as a steward of that portion of God's wealth entrusted to him, is obligated to support his local church financially. And that's a that's a mouthful right there. Uh, obligated that well, bless God, preacher. I give my dollar. Amen. You stand before God with that. That's okay. We believe that God has established the tithe as a basis for giving, but that every Christian should also give other offerings sacrificially and cheerfully to the support of the church, the relief of those in need, and the spread of the gospel. We believe that a Christian relinquishes all rights to direct the use of that tithe or offering once the gift has been made. All right? Genesis chapter and Galatians. Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 20. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Now that's an interesting statement. You go back and you look in Genesis 14 and find out what that all predates. That predates almost everything. And he gave a tithe of all. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. Honor uh, the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Oh, preacher, that's a, that, that's a promise to Israel. That's a promise to, uh, of the old covenant. Uh, that's a principle of the scriptures that carry forth throughout the Bible. Acts chapter 4, verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them, and bought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. Distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who was, <coughs> who by the apostles was surnamed Bartimus, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I'm not advocating that we live in a commune and we sell everything we've got and we give all the money. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not advocating that. I'm saying that's what they did here because that's what the, 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 cert, the situation, the circumstance required. Uh, but the idea is we give unto the Lord as he has blessed us. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, uh, but this I say, he which, showeth, uh, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, I'm not saying St. Corinthians chapter 9 teaches that if you'll sow the seed of $100, God will give you 1000 I'm not going to say that, but I will say the principle of Scripture is you sow bountifully, God, uh, you will reap bountifully. You will reap the harvest that God has prepared for you. I'm not putting a dollar figure on that. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know the Bible does say God will bless. Galatians 6, 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That, that idea of communication, Galatians 6, 6, he's talking about financial things. Communicating. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, let him that steals, steal no more. Or let him that stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor. Working with his hands, that uh, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Again, we're just talking about financial stewardship. 
1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, I, I want to help, but just time out right here just for a second. We got, oh goodness, we're out of time. Uh, but I, heard, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, those, that principle, that's an Old Testament principle. But how many times do they take an Old Testament principle like we just read here and they move it into the New Testament and they get that principle? It's okay for that. But you start talking about tithing, oh, it's not okay for that. That's a double standard. All right. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. But whoso saith the world, but whoso hath the world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of, uh, of God in him? So again, we're finishing up this idea of giving, and this is that's the last, that's the last slide. Uh, but but we've gone through the entire doctrinal statement. Now, well, am I naive enough to believe that every member of our church is in 100% agreement with everything that we've read? Probably not. I am not that naive. There are probably some things in there that so you look at and you go, now wait a minute, I don't know if I, I, don't know if I get that or not. I, you know, I, but I, here's what I am saying. There came a point in time in the life of this church where this church, and this predates me, but this church got together and went over this doctrinal statement and went over these bylaws where this comes from and as a church adopted them and said, this is the official position of our church. We've just gone over all of them. And here's the connection we're made. We're done tonight. The connection that we've made is this. Jesus laid out the word of God. He, he gave us so much when he was here on this earth. Over 40 different writers, over 1,600 years, gave us the Word of God, pinned it down. God preserved it for us. Through history of the church, we find these Bible doctrines that were held to from generation to generation. We now are that next generation that are given the commandment of God to hold fast to the faith that's once delivered unto the saints. To hold fast to that form of doctrine that we have. We're going to hand this baton to the next generation if the Lord tarries his coming. Are we holding fast the truth? Or will we be written, if the Lord tarries his coming, will we be written down in history as one of those groups that started out holding to the truth but fell away for whatever reason. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it's been just to share a part, portion of your word. I pray that you'll help us tonight as we have our prayer time and we get into our preaching time tonight that you will bless. Father, I so look forward to getting folks back in this building and being able to worship together. Father, I thank you for everything that we've been able to do over the last two months, but it has just not been the same. Father, we as Christians need fellowship. We as Christians need that encouragement. We need that uplifting time of being together. So Father, I pray that you'll help us. We love you. Looking forward to what you're going to do tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to turn. We're going to let you go with a little bit more of Railroad Creek, uh, and that way we won't cut anybody off. But uh, so, so this is the we'll we'll send you out with that. <laughs>